This is Mike Fasano. I'd like to welcome you to our special presentation on methodologic issues in performance measurement of life expectancies. I'll be covering why the mortality distribution uh, is the preferred uh, method. I'll also talk about pros and cons of actual versus restated analyses of actual to expected. And then last, I'll talk about some analytic options for restated actual to expected studies and some of the issues involved with that, as well as what we need to do to restore some trust into the life settlement market. Um, if you should have any questions, please feel free to email me at mfasano at fasanoassociates.com. My contact information also will be on the last slide of the presentation. Once again, welcome. I hope you find the presentation interesting. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation and for the good work that you've done in uh, putting together your best practices. A lot of effort that was coming into it. We've all struggled with these issues. And I think that um, uh, people don't appreciate how many things we agree with. Uh, certainly, I'll talk about a couple of issues that we don't agree with. Uh, and, and just at the outset, um, one of the comments that Vince made had to do with the challenge of relying on one number uh, to generate an actual to expected ratio. And I totally agree uh, with Lepper and with Vince that we need to be as granular as possible. But make no mistake about it, the more observations that you have going into an actual to expected ratio, the more legitimate is that number. And the example of 50 and 150 averaging to 100, as does 98 and 102, that dissipates as you increase the number of observations in the sample. So I think it would be unfortunate if in our desire to have granularity, we ignore the most basic and most statistically relevant variable, which is our total performance. So, let me move on. Just have to say that one. Um, I'd like to talk about three different areas uh, of, of methodological issues. One, uh, the point estimate versus the mortality distribution methodology. Uh, second, I'll talk about some of the issues of actual versus restated ATE analyses. And then third, because I want you to know I have an open mind on the issue, uh, I'd like to talk about some methodologies uh, for doing restated ATE because this is something I've given a lot of thought to. Okay, so what's the appropriate methodology uh, for doing a performance measure? Uh, point estimate or mortality distribution? The point estimate methodology is one in which we compare the specific predictions with actual deaths for those predictions. Some underwriters in the early days used this approach uh, to, to uh, report their performance, and they would report the percentage of people who died before the life expectancy. In fact, there are some fund managers today, uh, notably some who have uh, less than ideal performance, who as a way of justifying that they're really doing okay, will report that a certain percentage uh, uh, of people who have died have died before the prediction. It sounds very reasonable, but as I'll try to illustrate in the next few slides, it can be very misleading. This shows Fasano LEs of two years and less that we did between 2007 and 2009. Uh, and we did the analysis as of the end of 2009. And when we reported how many people died before predicted, it was 80%. Now, when we look at a longer period, 2001 to 2009, the percent dying before predicted is 64%. 2001 to 2007, chopping two years off of the period, we have 59% dying before the LA. And when we look at the 2001 to 2005 period of underwriting, as of the end of 2009, we see that 56% have died before the life expectancy. Now, so we see, depending on the period covered, the percent dying before the LE 
varies from 80% to 56%. But, but this methodology can be very misleading in the early years of analysis in that it doesn't tell us anything about those who are still alive. So let's look at the whole story. When we add the percentage of people who are still alive, we see that for the 07 to 09 period, where approximately 80% had died before the LE, there were still 47% of the population that was still alive that didn't get captured in the numbers. The longer the period of underwriting that we include, and the more years that we leave at the end of that period of underwriting, the lower the percentage still alive and the more meaningful the results. So that when we look at 2001 to 2005, only 2% 2 of the population are still alive at that point. And I would argue that then is a meaningful representation of our performance. And this uh, histogram shows a, a reasonably normal distribution. 54% died before predicted. The extra 4% who died before predicted offset the long tail on the right side of that distribution and the 2% who were still alive, or who still were alive as of the end of 09. So, I would argue that if you have enough time, a point estimate methodology can be very helpful. But this analysis was based on LEs of two years or less. How long would we need to use this methodology for LEs of 10 or 12 years? And the answer is a very long time, more time than, than, the, than we have. And it's for this reason that we turn to the mortality distribution. And I'd like to stress that, once again, this is something that all the underwriters agree on. And it's a very fundamental element uh, of the analysis. So when we talk about the mortality distribution methodology, we're talking about a methodology in which we take each life expectancy prediction and the mortality distribution associated with that prediction. We aggregate the mortality distributions for all predictions to generate one aggregate mortality distribution for all our LE predictions. And then we compare actual deaths with predicted deaths as per the aggregate mortality distribution. Okay, so this just shows uh, what the uh, uh, aggregate mortality would be uh, over time using the mortality distribution methodology. The red line in this uh, slide is actual uh, deaths. The blue line are expected deaths. And if you divide uh, expected uh, or actual by expected at any point in time, you get the actual to expected ratio. So let's talk about actual to expected analysis. Actual deaths, I think, are fairly straightforward. Expected deaths have become a little bit more controversial. Uh, now, I have to admit, uh, expected deaths never were controversial to me, and I guess that reflects the fact that I probably talk too much and don't listen enough sometimes. But I always thought expected deaths were the deaths that followed from the predictions that we made and put in our reports and gave to our clients. But I know now that there's more to expected deaths than that. But let's talk, talk first about actual deaths. The number of people who have died over the term of the analysis. We can run our database against the Social Security Master Death File to identify deaths and then make an assumption as to IBNR uh, and incurred but not reported deaths. Uh, Vince covered the components of IBNR, master death file errors, client and underwriter database errors, lag in reporting to the Social Security Administration. I think we all agree uh, that IBNR needs to be explicitly disclosed to facilitate analysis before and after IBNR. Let's talk now about expected deaths because this has become controversial. For every life expectancy estimate, there's a distribution of mortality around that estimate. We need to disclose the mortality table used to build the, more, the, the distribution around the point estimate of LA. 
want to talk a little bit about the common table now, because we've had a lot of discussion about that. The argument for the common table is very straightforward. If underwriters in one set of analyses use a common table to build the distribution around their point estimates, we will facilitate apples to apples comparisons among the LE underwriters. This doesn't mean that we're limited to doing this. It means that we would do one set of analysis based on this. And if the Lisa Cat table was inadequate, and I have to admit I wasn't a fan of that table either, then let's come up with one that is adequate. And bear in mind, back solving for a mortality rating is common practice in the industry. The Millman model is developed in that method, now the Max model. You take life expectancy, you enter it into the Millman model, you pick the mortality table of your choosing, it solves for the distribution around that, and investors commonly do that and compare the results among LE underwriters. So it's not that complicated or difficult of a task. And once again, I've never argued that it's the only analysis, but that it is a useful analysis because if you don't, you can have the undesirable situation where two underwriters give the same life expectancies on the same portfolio, but by virtue of the slope of the mortality tables they use, end up with different results. This is just an extreme example to show how that can be. You have a red mortality distribution, which is a reasonably normal pattern of mortality, and the blue, which is what you might call a deterministic uh, pattern of mortality. Both have life expectancies of 11 years, but if you were to do an actual to expected analysis and chart out the actual deaths for the first 10 years, the underwriter with the blue distribution would generate a significantly higher actual to expected than the underwriter with the red distribution, even though both underwriters had given the same exact life expectancies on all the cases in the portfolio. Let's talk about expected deaths. Are they deaths as per the actual predictions that we give our clients, or are they deaths based on hypothetical, restated, or adjusted predictions, perhaps based on current mortality tables and methodologies? There really are advantages of both, and I just want to stress uh, that, that neither one nor the other is absolutely the best. Uh, the advantages of using adjusted or restated estimates, first of all, they have intuitive appeal. They're a measure of how accurate our current methodology and mortality tables are, and what value is there in dwelling on past mistakes. What are some of the disadvantages? Adjusted analyses are difficult to audit. Actual LA estimates are documented, documented. An auditor could look at our database and compare what we have reported with what our reports actually indicated. Whereas when we use restated estimates, how does the user of our report know that the methodology and the tables that we say we're using today are in fact the tables and methodologies we're using today, and more important, are the methodology and tables that we'll be using tomorrow or the next day. Second of all, as I'll try to illustrate a little bit later on in the presentation, uh, adjusted ATE analyses are difficult to do right, and they favor those, I would argue, who use a more simple approach to improving action to expect it. That is to say, those who change their mortality tables and don't also change their underlying model or debiting. Third, there's a question of relevance. If our current business mix is different than our prior business mix, that is to say, if we have less viatical business than we did 10 or 12 years ago, if we have less premium finance than we did three or four years ago, there's a real question 
as to whether benchmarking our underwritings from five to ten years ago based on our current business is relevant. So let's just go over some questions. First of all, will the ultimate investor realize that quote-unquote current basis uh, action to expected really means hypothetical adjusted A to E based on restated estimates? I think terminology is very, very important. And I would ask whether there's any reason for us not to label clearly current basis as hypothetical, adjusted, and restated. Third, does actual A to E have any relevance? So I've got um, an example here, and maybe uh, pay attention and get some audience participation if we could. We've got three underwriters, underwriters A, B, and C, all of whom have restated A to E's of 100%, but underwriter A has an actual A to E that is based on the actual predictions given to his clients of 95%. Underwriter B had an actual A to E of 100, well, first one had 95%, underwriter B had 105%, and underwriter C had 65%. So I'm going to give the audience four options. You can pick either underwriter A, underwriter B, underwriter C, or any of the above. Who would pick underwriter A? Okay, so no one would pick underwriter A. Underwriter B. We've got a show of hands, okay. People are timid here. There's a lot of this, none of this. Um, okay, underwriter C. Okay, underwriter A and underwriter C aren't doing so well. And who uh, would think it doesn't matter that any of them would be just as good as the other? Okay, so underwriter B wins, and I guess we could conclude from that that actual A to E really does matter, although some cynics, I think, would say that uh, who would get picked would be uh, uh, the shortest of the uh, uh, LA underwriters. I think it depends where you are in the process. So that's very helpful. Um, but trying to be serious for just a moment, uh, uh, one of the most important questions, and, and I think this is why we need to strive for a methodology that does at least provide for one measure of apples to apples comparisons, is do our reported actual to expected ratios reconcile with LE spreads still seen in the market? And I think the reality is, if we're honest, all of the underwriters are advertising actual to expected ratios of close to 100%. But if you look at spreads in the marketplace, they are still significant. This was done by AM Best, and they did one set of analyses before the 21st and ABS extensions of 08, and then another after. In their analysis, the spread between the shortest and the longest was 24 months before the changes and then 10 months after. Clearly a move in the right direction, but also clearly still significant spreads. This is an analysis that was done by the Cantor Group. You see that in 06. The green line is our Fasano LEs, the red uh, are 21st, and the blue are ABS. The pattern is the same. That is to say, we've been the longest, uh, and, and that hasn't changed. Although, uh, when you look at the 09 time frame, see a significant narrowing of spreads, and that I think is good news. But once again, if you look at the current, the present heads, we still see significant spreads in the market. So the fact of the matter is there are differences among the underwriters. That's not necessarily bad, but I would think those differences should be reflected in our ATE results. And if they're not, I think that could raise questions about the validity of those results. This was a larger portfolio done in 2010 of over 1,200 lives. It was underwritten by Fasano, ABS, and 21st, and the spread between the longest and the shortest in this portfolio was, was a little bit over 14 months, or 11%. Uh, I've seen a lot of comparisons, and I've yet to see a comparison today or before in which there weren't significant spreads among the LE underwriters. So let's talk about the last area, 
uh, and that is methodologies for doing a restated ADE analysis. And I want to stress once again, I think there's value to doing restated analyses as long as you practice truth in advertising and make it clear that that's what you're doing, and as long as you disclose explicitly how you made your adjustments. So, if you don't change your debiting or underwriting model, doing an adjusted ATE is fairly straightforward. You solve for and plug in the mortality table that would give you 100% A to E. I would argue if you use this approach, you will inevitably estimate too short on certain lives and too long on other lives, because we all know that the mortality improvement is impairment specific. And if cardiovascular mortality has improved dramatically over the last 20 to 30 years as it has, our view is the best way to adjust for that is in our risk assessment, in our debiting, in the mortality ratings that we associate with cardiovascular disease, and not to try to bury that into a mortality table change. But different people can have different views, and I accept that. I will just make the point, if you take the view that I do, that we need to change both our debiting and our tables, then doing an adjusted analysis becomes more of a challenge and very assumption dependent. So, three options for doing an adjusted ATE analysis. One would be to re-underwrite every file that you've ever seen. The second would be to re-underwrite sample cells and apply the results of those re-underwritings to the larger populations from which they were derived. And the third would be to benchmark our old mortality ratings to our current underwritings and then apply adjusted uh, mortality ratings to the current mortality tables. In every instance, I would ask the question, can the restated actual to expected analysis be validated? I think this is a very, very important consideration. So let's talk about re-underwriting sample cells because clearly re-underwriting an entire block of business would not be feasible. At Fasano, we have 15 primary impairment categories. This is less than most underwriters. But working with just 15 primary impairment categories and 10 years that we've been in business would generate 150 cells to start with if we were to do a sample cell re-underwriting methodology. If we require a minimum of 20 uh, files or 20 underwritings per cell, that gets us up to 3,000 re-underwritings. We would calculate the average of the re-underwriting life expectancies to that of the prior underwritings and apply that ratio from the sample cells to the policies or files in the larger populations from which those samples were derived. But is it reasonable to assume the same ratio change in life expectancies across mortality ratings, or might it be more reasonable to uh, break the cells down further so that you compare changes of underwritings with low mortality ratings versus those, let's say, with high mortality ratings. If you do that, that, that simple change, you've doubled now your, your re-underwritings from 3,000 to 6,000. But perhaps as important, how does the user validate that the re-underwritten cells weren't manufactured to get the desired result? Now, I'm not suggesting we would do that or anyone would do that, but the fact of the matter is, if you can't validate how we came up with the re-underwritten or adjusted results, I would argue it would call question to those results. So let's talk about benchmarking, which I think ultimately, uh, for those of us who have changed both our debiting and our tables, is probably the best approach. This entails strat stratifying the database by year and by mortality rating deciles, so that you look at in every year, what was the median mortality rating of cases we underwrote, what was the mortality rating at the 10th decile, the 20th, 30th, and so forth. And you apply those current mortality ratings 
to the appropriate deciles from earlier underwritings. So for example, if our median mortality rating today is 115%, and if in 2001 it was 150%, then we would adjust mortality ratings from 2001 of 150% down to 115% to be consistent with our current underwritings. And we would then apply those mortality ratings to our current mortality tables. I think that's a reasonable methodology, but it presumes that business in 2001 was the same as it is today, which may or may not be the case. So what are some questions on benchmarking? Should we split the mortality rating deciles further by age, for example? and do desop comparisons of younger ages underwritten today to younger ages underwritten earlier, and a separate analysis of older ages underwritten today to older ages written earlier. How do we define current underwriting? Let me get some more audience participation. I'll give four choices. 2009, the year after the Ellie adjustments. 2010, the most current year, an average, a simple average of 2009 and 2010, or a weighted average of 2009 and 2010. Who would vote for 2009? Okay. We're running short on time, so I'm not going to ask you. But answer it yourself and, and, and let me know later. Um, do we include clinical judgments with calculated equivalent mortality ratings in the analysis. A lot of what we do are research-based clinical judgments for which there isn't a mortality rating. So we have to uh, decide whether we should include these in our analysis. Based on these three sets of questions, we've got 16 sets of assumptions that we could pick from to do an adjusted analysis. So what's the impact of this? In 2007, our median mortality rating was 125%. Our minimum mortality rating was 100%. In May of 2008, we implemented a debt reduction formula at the older ages such that the minimum mortality rating was 80% at the older ages. So we have to decide, once again, for age benchmarking, do we include all ages or do we segment out older from younger ages? Do we include or exclude clinical judgments? And what benchmark period do we use? This is an example of the results and the impact of assumptions. Based on a 125% median mortality rating in 2007, for a male non-smoker age 74, the life expectancy would have been 156 months. If we were to adjust that based on 2010 underwritings, including clinical judgments in our benchmarking, and using age-distinct cohorts to do the analysis, the result we would get would be 151 months, or five months less than we had originally. If we used a weighted average of 2009 and 2010, excluding clinical judgments, and used an age-distinct methodology, which I think, by the way, is the most reasonable set of assumptions, the adjusted LE would be 162 months, or roughly 4% longer. If on the other hand, we use 2009 as the benchmark period, excluded clinical judgments, and included all ages, we get an adjusted LE of 168 months, or 12 months longer than our initial estimate. So based on the assumptions we use, all of which I would argue are reasonable, we can have a spread and adjusted LE of 17 months or 11%. The point I'm trying to drive home here is there are significant differences in adjusted LE based on our assumptions. We need to be aware of that. Now what else can adjust uh, affect the results? The time period cover. Um, the, the leper document, the original leper document, was silent on the time period cover. But the fact of the matter is, the time period cover will affect the A to E results. And we need to be explicit as to what time period will be covered by the A to E analysis. And this is the next to the last slide, so I will be done in a second. 
Um, we need to be explicit as to the time period that will be covered in the ATE analysis. I would argue that we should do an analysis based on when we first started underwriting, because I think that presents the best total picture of our performance. What LEs should be excluded? If there's a DOB, date of birth or social security error, should it be excluded? If it was a qualified estimate, should, be, should it be excluded? If it's quote unquote a special review, should it be included? I would argue that unless we explicitly qualify the estimate, or unless there was a documented error, that everything should be included. So what does this lead us to? I think it gets down to, do you trust us? Do our actual to expected results reconcile with LE spreads in the marketplace? Do we practice truth in advertising? If we do a restated analysis, do we make it clear that it's a restated analysis? Have we been transparent as to our methodology? Or is everything a secret sauce? Have we been consistent in our underwriting and in our mortality tables? Are our business objectives and those of our owners consistent with yours? And last, do we participate in industry comparative studies, such as the one that BI will be describing, or do we find excuses not to? I would argue that whatever we come up with in terms of best practices, if we can answer yes to all of these questions, we will make a huge step forward in regaining investor confidence. And I hope a year from now, we'll all be able to do that. Thank you for your indulgence. I know